thank you for accepting us here and, uh, and giving us your warm uh, welcome. Uh, if you don't know, Mentone Church is uh, close to Redlands. And if you have time, you could visit us there. So our study for today, um, as our lesson have been studying for the last quarter, is to the least. It's all about, I, I, I believe, the practical side of, of the gospel, uh, wherein Jesus Christ uh, was once asked in Matthew 25, Jesus, who, where were you? Were you, where were you naked? Where were you hungry? Where, were you in prison? We didn't do that to you. But as Jesus Christ said, if you have done to the least, you have done it to me. I believe the gospel is a story of a common experience. Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt among us to the surprise of the heavenly kingdom. They were worshiping Jesus Christ in heaven, and then they found out that Jesus Christ was not just going to be an angel. He wasn't just going to be a perfect man in physicality as Adam but he was going to be like us. Man that has been weakened in thousands of years of experience here on, the, in, on earth. And Jesus Christ was going to be like us. For if you think about it, there are so much blessing why he became like us. It's like I just overheard this week while I was working in the hospital, one of my coworker, um, he's, a, he's a tall, blonde, curly-haired guy, and he's very adventurous, and he's a surfer. He would go out uh, to Mexico for weeks at a time, and we would, we would be worried about him because we wouldn't have any contact with him. And then he would just go back to work and say, hey, I'm back. But we're worried about him because he's so adventurous. And I know at one time in his life, he was surfing and he got in an accident. He broke his neck. But thank God it wasn't like broke the spinal cord. You could broke your bone, but thank God the spinal cord wasn't snapped. So for three months, he was telling me he had a halo. You know that halo when it stabilizes? Your, your bone on your neck so you won't move around and snap your spinal cord and be paralyzed. So he was, he's a nurse now. So he's talking to a patient. He was telling the patient, come on, be strong. Be strong with, with what you're going through with your neck because I, I was in a halo for three months. If I could do it, you can do it too. So the gospel is not just a declaration in saying, God has saved us. But he also enables us to overcome as he had overcome. And as we will find out, God asks for perfection. Remember Matthew Jesus Christ said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that, and that will be found in Matthew 5, 48. But in Luke chapter 6, 36, it says, be therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. So here was Matthew saying, be perfect. And Luke was coinciding and supporting that by illustrating all the more, how you, can you be perfect? Luke said, be merciful, as your Father in heaven is merciful. So Jesus Christ came here to earth, experiencing what we went through. He didn't need mercy because he never sinned, but going and growing around this world, 
he was able to see for himself what the human experience was all about. In Luke chapter 2, 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. When you say increase, does it mean that you're adding and gaining more? Of course. Jesus was like us. He was learning as we do, as we did when we were children. Let me read to you a quote from Sister White to illustrate it even more. For a long time, Jesus dwelt at Nazareth, an honored or unknown that he might teach men how to live near God while discouraging while discharging the humble duties of life. It was a mystery to angels that Christ, the majesty of heaven, should condescend not only to take upon himself humanity, but to assume its heaviest burdens and most humiliating offices. Imagine that. Jesus Christ, the point of praise and worship in heaven, but now here on earth, he was doing the heaviest burdens in the most humiliating offices. This he did not in order to become like one of us. This he did in order to, beca to become like one of us, that he might be acquainted with the toil, the sorrows, and fatigue of the children of men. In Hebrews says, he was tempted in all points just like as we are. We, a Jesus, are like, is, was like us. He went through all the experiences that we are going through and that we have went through. Another quote. Jesus was familiar with poverty, self-denial, and need. The ex this experience was a protection for him. He had no idle time to open the way for corrupting friendships. Nothing not gain or pleasure, applause, or criticism could get him to consent to a wrong act. Christ, the only sinless one who ever inhabited the earth, lived among the weak, weak, wicked inhabitants of Nazareth for ne nearly 30 years. This fact is a rebuke to those who think they are dependent on place, fortune, or prosperity to live a blameless life. God is asking us in Micah 6, 8, it says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to, work, to walk humbly with thy God. God is requiring us that. Love mercy, do justly, and walk humbly with thy God. If God is asking us, requiring us, to do those things, we may say, uh, I'll try my best, God. I'll do it with my own strength, 100%. How do you think that will end up? All our righteousness are filthy rags. Or we could say, Lord, it's too tough. I can't handle it. I'll just give up. You're requiring too, too high of a standard on me. So where do we go? Do we depend on ourselves or do we just give up? I present to you that Christ in us, our hope and glory, the author and finisher of our faith, he is the one who is going to do the work for us and in us. And our part is to cooperate to him, surrender to him, because he has went through everything that we that we have went through and overcame them. Jesus was always moved with compassion. It's always in the Bible, numerous stories, when he saw thousands of people who were hungry. He was moved with compassion. And I would present to you the Beatitudes from Matthew 5 to 7, the greatest sermon ever told and the longest sermon, I believe, that Jesus Christ ever preached. And if you allow me, I, we would 
go through some points in those chapters that will make us realize how Jesus and what Jesus teaches and how he was able to teach those teachings. Let me just go to the Bible. And seeing the multitudes, this is in the start of chapter 5. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and he was set, his disciple came unto him. So at the start, Jesus Christ already saw the multitude. He saw their needs. And so he called them up, and his disciples came, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let me present to you those blessings that Jesus pronounced. And he was able to pronounce it because in each step he experienced it just like us. Jesus wasn't poor in spirit because he always had the Holy Spirit. But in his surroundings he saw the poorness of people, the poverty. But he could say to them, in your poverty, when you realize that you don't have anything, then you have the kingdom of heaven. That, at that point of realization and accepting that only God could fill your needs, God is already there. God is guaranteeing, I will be with you in your poorness. And you will see at the start of the blessing, What's the first blessing? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the last blessing is also, blessed are you when men shall, blessed are when they are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. At the starting point and at the end, you have the kingdom of heaven. God is with you because when, when Jesus and John the Baptist prophesy out, preach first, what did they say? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who's at hand? Jesus. When you have Jesus, you have the kingdom of heaven. And when you go through this, mourning, meek, and you are hungering, those are the things that Jesus is. He, he mourned for all the things that he was seeing in this world, the, 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 the suffering. He was always moved with compassion. Jesus is the meekest of all. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Every morning, the Bible said he would go and have time with God. I mean, I present to you my own, I, I'm sure all of us have our own devotional life and time with God. But for me personally, my devotional life and spiritual life never changed until I started devoting time with God every day. And before I was saying, one hour, I, that's too much. But you know what? When you have tasted the water, when you have tasted the bread of life, you would want to have it more. And during the whole day, when we are tempted to say, uh, should I do this or do that? You know what? Think of what God wants you to think and do at that moment. It is said in, in Thessalonians, it says, pray without ceasing. Is that possible? I'm thinking, am I going to kneel and move around on my knees and with my eyes closed all the time? 
Is that even possible? You know what Sister White says? If prayer is the only thing you will do, sooner or later you're going to stop praying. So what is the Bible saying about praying without ceasing? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Yes, be aware of everything that's happening because there's a battle out there. But I present to you the, the Lord's Prayer. What's the Lord's Prayer? John 7, what about? John 17. John 17. Just the, the Jesus prayer. Oh, in Matthew, in Matthew 6, it says, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, O heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Jesus is asking us for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is it reasonable to think that when Paul says pray without ceasing, it is asking God for his will all the time? In all our thoughts, in all our works, we should be doing his will. And that is praying without ceasing. I know it's hard. I know it's not easy. But we all take small step towards perfection, through God's perfection. With God, as Jesus Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. But with Jesus, we can do all things, right? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So it envelops everything that we do in work, in places that we uh, encounter people, even in the things we say jokingly with people. I mean, when I was younger, or I, would, I, have, I had fun joking around with people because it, it's funny. But you know what? I realize I even have to be careful about those things because it's easy to joke, but when you hurt someone, that's hard to take back. And you realize that's not God's will. So we go back to the Beatitudes. The pure in heart, the peacemaker, the, our lesson touched on that. Jesus wanted people to come together. And not to come together with their own interests, but out of the interests of God. And we will find out later on how God achieves that. And then, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, when he pronounced his beatitude, in a way he was already prophesying what was going to happen to him. He was going to be what? Persecuted. He was going to, to die. And, but there's a blessing there. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. When we follow Jesus Christ, we are going to have tribulation and trials. If you don't have Jesus Christ, are you going to have tribulation and trials? Of course. Wouldn't you want to be with Jesus when you go through those tri tribulation and trials? That's better, right? That's much, much better. Because he who lived godly shall suffer persecution. It's guaranteed. Don't, it's, as Peter said, don't think it's a surprise that, that difficulties are happening in your life. It's going to happen. Trials are going to happen to you. First, it's a blessing. Because as Paul said, he rejoiced in infirmities. In, 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 uh, in the book of Corinthians, he said, when I am weak, then he is strong. Jesus is seen, his grace is seen when we allow him to fill us up to our days of trial. Paul was suffering through a physical malady. Probably he was had poor eyesight, and he was asking God, God, heal this. But God said, no. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That's why the disciples, when they 
were imprisoned, when they were flogged, what did they do? Did they become depressed or run away? What did they do? They rejoice. They rejoice that they are suffering something that Jesus Christ went through. I'm, I'm just speculating, it could be a sacred guess, that in the thoughts of the disciples, Jesus, we weren't with you when you were dying on the cross. But thank God you're with us now when we are suffering for you. When we are going through experiences in our lives that we don't understand, if we believe God, He is with us. In the darkness moment of your life, light is most appreciated. That's when God comes in. And often enough in our lives, we pray and pray God is not delivering, not giving us uh, what we need. Somebody said, uh, don't stop praying because God is not, uh, God is not responding. No, don't stop praying until you hear God. Okay. God is going to say and lift you up. And usually it's in the last moment when everything seems to be lost. When all human uh, capabilities have been exhausted so that when God delivers you, you have no doubt. Other people have no doubt that it is Him who delivered you. And God is looking for witnesses of His life being lived in us. Some people say, I'm going through a lot. You know what? Your difficulty is your ministry. Your test is your testimony. Your mess is your message. Probably God put you in that situation so that you will shine and tell others of God's goodness. Jesus went through difficulties, even as a child, if you will read it in the Desire of Ages. Imagine that one of the earlier chapters in the Desire of Ages, Jesus as a child was entitled Days of Conflict. Jesus as a child was persecuted by his siblings. He was, his parents were dogged by the rabbis who wanted Jesus to be taught by them. Because they saw the potential in Jesus. They wanted to mold him according to their own rituals and beliefs and, and dogmas. Imagine that as a child, going through stress, being pulled every now and then. But Jesus manifested godly character. So you, we are not alone. When we are going through difficulties of our own, that's when we can say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being with me. And I remember that song, if you can see Jesus, trust his heart. Trust his heart. He is always there. So when we move forward, Jesus Christ said, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. He says you, we are the light of the world. But of course, he also claims to be the light. So whatever he claims to be, he enables us to be also as such. And then he touches on the issue of the commandments. Think not that I come to destroy, or to, to think not that I come to destroy the Lord, the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Everyone thought, oh, Jesus is teaching something. No, he is fulfilling the commandments. And he is fulfilling it by living it and loving others. All of the commandments Paul said, is embodied in loving your neighbor. And Jesus Christ showed that. Of course, sometimes it's easier. Which one should we rather do? Love our friends and, and good neighbors or love those who don't deserve it, we think don't deserve it, our enemies? At the end of chapter 5, Jesus Christ kind of encapsulated it when he said in verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despisefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. 
For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same? And if you salute your brethren, only what do you more than the others? Do not even the publicans do? And then Jesus Christ said, Be ye perfect, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. If you love somebody who doesn't love you, then you are being merciful to them. And the perfection of God is in you. Do you love somebody who just talked bad at you recently? Do you love somebody who just took something away from you? Do you love somebody who physically hurt you? And Jesus Christ demonstrated the greatest show of love at the cross when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Can we forgive somebody who continually do wrong things to us? Through God's help, we are protected. I mean, abuse is different. But if we find ourselves in situations wherein God is teaching us to love somebody in spite of what they're doing to us, to show them through our, how we respond in those tribulations that Jesus' character is going to be seen. You know, sometimes at work, and I ask for forgiveness, I would say something that, for some people, they think it's out of character of me. It's like, Jude, it's like, I, I told you earlier, I would joke sometime, and then they would look at me and, Jude, like, I didn't know you were like that. And I was thinking, oh, I go back and, and I would think, oh, I shouldn't have said that. So we, in our own sphere, we don't know how we affect people. And that in itself we should be praying for, that hopefully we manifest God's character all the time. And especially in difficulties, are we easily distraught? Are we even cursing? Are we, are we easily giving up? You know, a lot of people are looking. A lot of people are watching. Is this person living up to what he is preaching to what he is saying. As they say, greater sermons have been preached not on the pulpit, but by the lives we live. Are we living the truth that Jesus Christ has given us? So, in, in chapter, I, uh, we have a few more minutes. In chapter six, I already touched the, the Lord's Prayer with regards to the doing God's will is praying without ceasing. And Jesus Christ mentioned one of the, my favorite verses in the Bible. When I was young, this thing, uh, this verses touched me. If you would go to Matthew chapter 6, verse... 25. I grew up poor in the Philippines. And um, any idea of food, I want that because we don't have a lot of food. But here is this first saying, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, which you shall eat, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feed them. Are you not much better than they? Wow, and in my young mind, I thought, yes, I see birds, they're being fed. But God looks at me more importantly than those birds. So if God takes care of those birds, surely he's taking care of me. And the same mind Jesus had. He would say he's poor, he doesn't 
He doesn't have a, even place to live in, like the foxes, but God takes care of him. And which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit in his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. I, I was growing up in the Philippines with only a few shirts in my possession. And this struck me, yes, God will give me clothes. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And in chapter 7, it says in verse 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks, receive. And he that seek, find it. And to him that knock, it shall be opened. O oh, what man is there for you whom, if his son asks bread, will give him a stone, or he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things that then that ask him? If we are sinful people, but we already have an idea, if, if a, my son asks for a bread, I'm not going to give him a stone. But God is better. God is more generous. And how could we say, if we ask him for something, he won't give it to us if it's for our own good? God will give it to us. And then the golden rule. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do so even to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus Christ has experienced poverty, tribulation, he saw the need of the people. That's why he could say this. That's why he could tell people, I needed things, but God provided it for me. And you should do the same thing to others if that's what you want. So Jesus is not just teaching out of a, a, a vacuum of no experience. No, he experienced all the needs that we went through. He experienced being hungry, being thirsty, being need of people. And now he could say, all those needs were provided by my Father. And now, you could also receive it if you follow in my footsteps. So we have a high priest that was tempted in all things and yet sinned not. And because of this, at the end of Matthew 7, 29, it says, For he taught them as one having authority and not, uh, not as the scribes. Who would you believe more? My friend who's a nurse who experienced having a halo on his head? Would you believe him who experienced a broken neck? Or would you believe me who didn't had that experience. We would believe somebody who had that experience. That's why Jesus was seen as somebody who's in authority because he experienced everything that we have went through. In John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace in the world. You shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In 1 John 3.16, not John 3.16, 1 John 3.16, and I would think it's a very good coincidence that it is read as such. We all know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever receive him should not perish but have everlasting life. But 1 John 3.16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3.16 confirms John 3.16.
that God loves us, how did he show his love? Just like in John 3.16, John 3.16 gave, he gave his son. First John 3.16 said, he laid down his life for us. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friend. But who, in verse 17, we'll continue, but whoso had this world's good and see it his brother have need and shut it up his bowels of compassion from him how dwelleth the love of God in him. So it continues. If you see your brother needing help, but you don't show compassion, how can you say love dwells in you? How many times we say, it's inconvenient for me to do some things? Yes, there may be reasonable reasons why you can't help somebody. But have you experienced in your life when oh, you're just rushing to do something and, and you hear a small voice saying, go back and say something to this person. I remember one time when, uh, I guess 2009, um, the first evangelistic series that we ever had at Mentone, 2009, we had an Amazing Facts evangelist come to Mentone. And it was supposed to start on a Friday. And on that Friday, I was in the, in the hospital and I was just talking to a young lady. She was a respiratory therapist. And I was about to leave. But then some voice told me, talk to him about the meeting that you will have this evening. And I guess I just did it. I told her, you know, we're going to have an evangelistic meeting at our church. And I didn't think much of it because I know she's busy. How is she going to come on the same day I told him that there's a meeting? A lot of people would say, oh, I have plans already. I can't go. But I told her that. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm going to try. You know, maybe just a courteous response, I'm going to try. But lo and behold, on that first night, she came. And for six weeks, we had evangelistic series. She came. And at the end of the series, she was baptized. If I didn't say anything, would she have been there? I don't think so. We are given opportunities by God at every moment. Pray without ceasing, meaning asking God for his will to be done at every moment. And he will show his will to us. It may not be a stupendous, miraculous act, but you may be planting a seed. It is not for us to, to see everyone's spiritual full growth. We are just asked by God to do what we can at that moment. That's what we are accountable for. Sufficient for the day, the burden there is. So I leave with you with a story which we all know. The story of Jesus and a woman caught in adultery. I will present to you this story because it reveals God's character of justice and mercy. In John chapter 8, we all know this story. There's this woman. She was dragged by the leaders of the church in the act of the adultery. And Jesus was just sitting down, bowed down, writing something in the sand. And this woman was brought to Jesus. And all the leaders had stones in their hands. All the people ready to stone her. What do you think was their purpose? What do you think was their real intention? All along we know Jesus Christ was being tested. They were trying to see where he stands. And this is in John chapter 8. In John chapter 5, Jesus 
already experienced tribulation and trials, wherein people were ready to kill him because they say he broke the Sabbath and that he made himself equal with God. And so from then on, they were just trying to find opportunity to kill Jesus. So here was Jesus with the woman being condemned by people. If Jesus said one thing like, this woman could go, she does not deserve death, who do you think will be stoned along with that woman? Jesus. Here, Jesus, he breaks the law. He deserves to die also. But if Jesus, on the other side, tells the people, you can stone her to death, she broke the law. What do you think would have been the message? That anyone under the power of sin has no hope. Jesus can't save you. But Jesus revealed the character of God. His justice. He affirmed that the penalty of sin is what? Death. He affirmed that. But he told them, if you're going to say someone's going to die, check first if you are righteous enough. He who has no sin, cast the first stone. You cannot judge somebody if you're guilty of the same sin. So everybody looked at each other and starting from the oldest, dropped their stones. But it didn't end there. Jesus looked around. Jesus looked at the woman. Is anyone here condemning you? The woman looked at Jesus and said, no one. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The greatest act of justice, the greatest act of mercy, seen in Jesus. May we follow his ways, always. Let us pray. Lord, Father in heaven, thank you for your blessing to your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for being here with us as we study your word to be nourished and fed and strengthened so that we may not falter against the enemy. For we know if we have faith, Lord, even the weakest of us with you is no match against the strongest devil. We ask for your blessing, Lord, as we continue with this program, that we may continually be blessed, blessed by your righteousness, blessed by your strength, that we could follow you from now on and sin no more. We pray in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
for prayer. Thank you, Jack. Shall we pray? Dear God, we are so happy that you have brought us once more in this wonderful place of prayer, the sanctuary. We are happy, Lord, for thy children who have come, especially for the Church of Menton, who have come to grace our Sabbath services. We thank you, Lord, for the participants who have rendered their part wonderfully. And now, Lord, we thank you for the lessons, the lesson especially this week which you have showed us how to relate ourselves with our fellow men, to walk humbly, to do justly, and to love mercy. Lord, may we do the works, the service that Jesus had done when he was on this earth. May we be the extension of Jesus, his feet, his arms, his uh, lips, Lord, that we may be able to be a voice to the voiceless, that we may extend our helping hands, those who are in need, and may we walk, Lord, to those places where we need to show, to share the gospel. And now, Lord, as we continue our service, may the Holy Spirit be with us and the blessing be upon us as we worship you in this wonderful Sabbath day. Forgive us, Lord, from our sins we have committed against you and save us in the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for answering your prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see you guys. We're going to start our church service, um, song service now, and we're going to start with the first, the first hymn will be Tis So Sweet, Trust in Jesus. Five hundred and twenty four. song will be Standing on the Promises, number 518. Standing 
Be great is thy faithfulness, number 100. Great is thy faithfulness, 100.
Lord, we confess truly are your mercies, your faithfulness great to us. Today we have gathered together to praise and worship you. We pray that your presence will be among us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll have a children's story. Well, good morning, guys. It's good to see you. Um, okay, so I have a story for you. You ready? So, back when I was about, how old are you? I was around 11 or 12. I had a dog, and her name was Huntress, and she was a hunting dog. So she loved to go out, and we had a big backyard, and she would go, and she would chase lizards. She would chase um, all sorts of little animals that she would find. And, well, one day she caught something, well, she tried to catch something that wasn't a lizard, and this thing could actually protect itself, and it ended up being really bad for her in the end. Can any of you guess what it was? Oh, you said it. It was a porcupine. Now, have any of you seen a porcupine before? What does it look like? It has big spikes, right? And so when it, anything gets close to it and it gets scared, it will, um, it will like smack you with its tail and all the spikes will go all over your face or your arms, or your hands. And that's exactly what happened to Huntress. So 
she took off after this porcupine and I was like running after her I was like Huntress no don't do that you're gonna get hurt and Huntress didn't know what a porcupine was so she ended up getting slapped in the face by its tail and her tongue and her mouth and her eyes and her ears and her nose were covered in spikes now do you think she was more than happy to come back after after that happened to her so I called her and called her, and finally, when she got hit by in the tail with a porcupine, she got um, she she wasn't so brave anymore, and she came back. And I took the spines out of her face, and it really hurt. And it hurt me because she kept disobeying me. Because guess what happened next time the porcupine shut up? Do you think she learned a lesson? You would think, you would think, but my dog is a little m mentally struggling in some areas still and she took it off after the porcupine again and she got slapped in the face again so this was the second time this happened three times with her and um, you would think that she would learn her lesson she didn't but every time after she got slapped in the face she was more than happy to come back and help me uh, let me help her take out the the porcupine quills now you would think that that was really stupid of her. But isn't that kind of something that we do to Jesus a lot? Because we're safe with him, right? But once we go off and start chasing after things that will hurt us, different sins in our lives, we think that's really fun until we get slapped in the face and we come to the realization, oh, that wasn't so fun at all. And now we're, we suffer the consequences. But when we ask Jesus to go ahead and and help us and and we come back to him then he's more than willing to forgive us and he he doesn't get mad at us instead he'll just he'll calm us down and he will take out the the um the sins that are in our lives so next time that we feel a temptation to go over after something that we probably shouldn't be going after just pray and jesus will help you Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for these kids. And Lord, just help us all to remember that next time we want to run after something that's going to hurt us in the long run, Lord, just please help us to listen to your call and for us to come back to you. And help us to remember that no matter, no matter how many times we run after the sins, that you always accept us back and clean us up. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You go back to your seats. Okay, thank you. In Malachi, it tells us that we should give offering. For if we hold back on our offering, then we're not blessing God. We're missing our own blessings also. So what we want to do, we're going to have, uh, can the... Urshas come up.
Uh, please, if you can, kneel with me for prayer. Father in heaven, uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you that we can all gather here together on this Sabbath day to worship you. Please help us understand your word, and may your will be done. Please forgive all our sins and um, help us to learn more about you. Um, Please be with those who are sick, and please be with those who need you right now. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is found in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. May the Lord bless the reading of this word. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It is a pleasure to be with you here in Apple Valley today. And I um, want to thank the uh, young people who minister to us with music. Uh, you see it's spelled out M-A-P in the bulletin, and that stands for Music with a Purpose. And we are thankful that God gave the gift of music to us, and we are thankful that there are those, our young people, who are willing to use that music purposefully to glorify God. And I want to remind you, if you aren't already aware of it, that after our fellowship meal today, uh, they are going to put on a concert for us. And we will be looking forward to that. So please plan for that after we, after we eat. Today, I hope by God's grace to challenge your thinking and uplift Jesus as the Savior of the world. That's why we come together, isn't it? To learn uh, what the Bible has to tell us about the great issues of life and how we can understand more about uh, Jesus and what he is doing for us. What we need, what the world needs, is not mind-expanding drugs. What we need is mind-expanding truth. And those truths are found in God's holy word, the Bible. So we're going to be looking at a number of Bible passages today. And uh, it is my prayer, and I'm going to ask you to pray for me, that uh, God will enable me to uh, reveal, declare, share these truths in a way that will make sense and deepen our appreciation for Christ and his love. Please bow your heads for me. I'm going to offer a prayer as we start. Our Father in heaven, today we have come together to worship you and to read from your holy word. We pray that our minds will be open and that you will illuminate them to understand more about the great issues of life and how magnificent your plan of salvation is. Bless us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of our subject today is Seeds. Seeds. I'm going to ask you to do something if you can, and it is going to be to try to, shall I say, erase from your mind for a little while what we already know, what is already self-evident, and try to look at it as if you, had, you did not know these things before, as if you had never heard of these things before, and now you're just being presented with them. And I want you to do that for the purpose that we can take a close look and we can truly be amazed at what God has given us. Seeds. Seeds are amazing. Seeds have power. They're a marvel of engineering and miniaturization. I believe that seeds properly looked at are a powerful testimony in behalf of Bible creation. Now when Brother June invited me a while back to come and uh, share Sabbath with you folks, I thought, what, would, what could we talk about that would be meaningful and appropriate? And I thought, well, we're coming to Apple Valley. So let's talk a little bit about seeds and I, I brought along uh, an apple. Now, I had intended to bring home, bring with you, uh, bring for you an apple that came from my yard, but it got left behind by negligence somehow. But I have an apple anyway. Um, what's, what's in this apple? Seeds. Seeds. Let your mind go a step further, though. What's in this apple? Is it another apple? Mm, maybe. Is it an apple tree? Well, you could say so, perhaps. But upon closer examination, I want to open your mind to think that what's in this apple is not merely another apple, not merely an apple tree, but an orchard. There's an orchard inside this apple. Now, I have an apple seed here. It's so tiny I put it in this bag here, because if I put it in my pocket, I'm sure I wouldn't be able to find it. I don't know if you can see it there. It's right down there kind of at the corner. 
That is an apple seed. This is an amazing thing. This, this little seed right here has all the plans, all the engineering, all the DNA, all the schematics to make a tree. Now, if you were to take that seed and, and slice it open with a knife and try to ask yourself, where is all that information packed in there? We really couldn't, we really couldn't tell, tell by that, could we? And yet it's there. Or let me put it another way. Let me say, let me say uh, what I want you to do is take a five-gallon bucket and fill it with dirt. And then I want you to pour water on it. And we're going to wait to see if after a while we get something like this. Do you think that could happen? Here's a five-gallon bucket. We're going to pour some water on it. And after a while, we're going to expect to get this. Is that going to happen? But if this goes in the soil, this can happen. As I say, try to erase from your mind for just a little while what we already know and approach it as if you didn't know and try to imagine. If you came to somebody that had never known about seeds and nature and said, you know what, there's all the information in this little thing right here to produce trees that are going to bring forth fruit. That is an amazing thing. It's truly an amazing thing. We're going to talk about seeds today. And the point I want to stress is that there is um, unsuspected potential and power in a seed. I would say deceptively uh, uh, so, but I don't want to use the word deceptively because we're going to use the word seed in a positive way. But you might not suspect that everything that is needed to produce this is packaged inside this little dot of a seed. Now, seeds come in all kinds of sizes and varieties. Sometimes they're large. Sometimes fruits have just one seed, like an avocado. But more often than not, there's like a super abundance, uh, a, 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 more than the mere necessity. Have you ever tried to count the seeds in a banana? or a watermelon, or a pineapple, or a strawberry. There's much more than need. I believe that's an expression of God's generosity. Because God is the one who did all the engineering to put that in this tiny little seed. This seed, if, uh, if put into the proper environment, given time and opportunity, is going to become an apple-making machine. And it's going to have part of it that's above the ground. It's going to have part of it's below the ground. What's below the ground is going to accomplish a dual purpose. Those roots are going to be stabilizers so the tree doesn't fall over even in strong winds. And those roots are going to have the ability to draw from the soil the moisture, the minerals, the nutrients necessary to make the machine work. And it's going to produce blossoms at the right time of the year that are going to attract bees to come and do the pollination so that apples come. Now we have a tree in our yard have more than one tree, but one especially that does so well. It's called an Anna apple. I know coming to Apple Valley, I'm sure you folks know much more about apples than I do. But this is an Anna apple that we have in our tree, and it has been a tremendous blessing. It doesn't bear every year. I don't know why, but when it does, it goes crazy. And this year was one of those years, and we kept up with it as best we can. We have like 20 gallons of applesauce in our freezer, and uh, there are many more that were left on the ground that uh, didn't get harvested in time or whatever. But what an incredible machine. It's all packaged in this. The point is that this is, you might not recognize, you might look at that and not see the potential of what it is because it has the capacity to uh, expand and mushroom and become something much bigger than you might at first think. Its outgrowth is unimaginable. Uh, you're me you're me yeah, not measurable, not measurable. And we're going to use that theme as we think about the scripture that we had as our, our text today from Genesis 3.15. So if you have your Bible, open it to that text. We're going to take a very careful look at that text and what it says. I believe this text in itself is like a seed. It has so much packed in it, uh, it takes a little time to... Uh, to completely understand it all. Genesis 3.15 is the first promise of salvation. I'm going to read it again. 
The Lord is speaking to the snake. The snake is the medium that de the devil used to bring temptation. And after transgression came in, the Lord came and visited with Adam and Eve and the serpent. And to the serpent he said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now in my Bible, that word seed is capitalized. And we'll come to that a little bit later why that's so. He will bruise your head, you will bruise his heel. In this text, we're going to see that there is an amazing prophecy and a wonderful promise. But this is not the first time the word seed is used in the Bible. The first time that the word seed is used in the Bible is in the first chapter of Genesis, and we're going to read verse 11. Genesis 1 verse 11 says, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. God invented fruit, and he put in the fruit seeds that have the amazing ability to propagate and proliferate and expand in a way that's hardly imaginable. When the devil decided that he was going to try to involve the human race in his rebellion, which was not an immediate decision, by the way, but when he came to that decision, the Lord, in his mercy, wanted to give Adam and Eve an opportunity to declare their allegiance to him. Now, there was no temptation. There was no evil in the garden. So the Lord designated something. He said, this tree and the fruit that's on this tree, the knowledge of good and evil tree, do not eat it. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. If you refrain from eating that fruit, you will declare your love, your trust, your faith, your allegiance to me. But if you eat of the fruit, you will join in the rebellion by the arch deceiver. They had been forewarned. They had been told that a rebellion had taken place in heaven and, and there would be one who would try to bring them into that rebellion. But they would have a chance to uh, remain on God's side, maintain their innocence, their purity, their wonderful existence, if they would refuse to eat of that tree, by the way, how many times would they have to say no before they were safe and secure? You know what the answer is? It's going to break your heart. One time. One time. If they had said no one time, the story of planet Earth would be different. Tragedy. But they didn't. Eve was deceived. Adam was not deceived, but he felt he was in a corner. Either I've got to say goodbye to Eve and stay with God, or I've got to join with Eve and disobey God. That was an act of unbelief on his part. He didn't believe that God could solve the problem. Could God have solved that problem? Absolutely he could have. But Adam didn't see it at the moment. So he took the, we don't know if it was an apple or not, popular belief says it was. He took the fruit and just ate on it in an act of defiance. And that changed what happened to planet Earth. Now God is faced with a big problem. God's problem is that he loves the human race, Adam and Eve. And the command was, if you eat the fruit thereof, in that day you will surely die. Now, Lucifer and his rebel angels companions in heaven had persisted in their rebellion to the point where they had crossed that invisible line. They had committed the unpardonable sin. They already knew about God's glory. They had been witnesses to his power and his love. There was nothing that could be done for them. There was no further demonstration of God's love that would change their way of thinking. But for Adam and Eve, the Lord said it's different. Now, when Lucifer decided to try to involve the human race, try to tempt Adam and Eve, he had two thoughts in mind. There are two ways I can win, he thought. Number one, if I get them to disobey, then I have control of the garden. And what's in the garden? Not just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's also another important tree called the tree of life. Satan said to himself, if I gain control of the garden, I will have access to the tree of life and I will 
live forever. Secondly, he said, if I get Adam and Eve to sin and somehow God makes some provision, some second chance or whatever, then he can't do it for them and not for me. But he was wrong on both accounts. Satan was wrong on the first account because Adam and Eve did not have clear title to the garden. They were on a probationary status. They were given dominion, and in their sphere, they exercised rulership, but they did not have total, complete, clear title. Fee simple in real estate language. Somebody comes to your house, they knock at the door and say, this is a nice house, I think I'd like to buy it. And you say, well, you know what? I'm just renting here. Can you sell the house if you're just renting? No, you can't. Adam and Eve didn't have clear title. They were on a probationary status. So when Lucifer got Adam and Eve to sin, he did not acquire in totality, in an unlimited way, planet Earth. He thought that he was going to, but he did not. Now, he was given access and powers that we still experience today. It is Lucifer that makes the hurricanes, the typhoons, the earthquakes, and all these other things. And our world is changed because of what Lucifer's power has accomplished. But he did not have unlimited control. He does not have unlimited control. So God is faced with a problem. First of all, I said, if you eat that fruit, you will surely die. So question, was that warning fulfilled? Did they die? No. Yes. You ever hear of questions that are yes or no? This is a question that's a yes and no. Did they die physically? No. Why not? Because at that very minute, Jesus Christ stepped in and said, I will pledge my life. I will accept the punishment that they deserve. They deserve to die. And without that interposition, they would have died instantly. But what does the Bible say? Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. He became the sacrifice at that moment. Now, it would be 4,000 years later until it was lived out in reality on Calvary. But he pledged his life. So they did not die physically, but they did die spiritually. They did die spiritually. The innocence... The spiritual nature that they were given at creation, what does the Bible say? God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he did exactly that. Adam and Eve were, uh, resembled God in form, feature, and character. They were programmed, that's not a good word, but they were uh, created with the capacity to do good, to love righteousness, to be like God. But when they sinned, that spiritual nature was gone. And they began to experience the effects of sin, partially, fear, guilt, shame, nakedness, all these things. The thought I want to put in your mind as we talk about seeds and how something so small can become something so big, I don't think that it was a coincidence that the object that was involved in the transgression, the test, was fruit. Now, God could have come up with some other system, I'm sure. He could have come up with some other test, but he chose something, fruit, that had a very meaningful lesson in it, and that is that fruit contains seeds, and even though it might look small and harmless and innocent, it becomes much, much bigger. In other words, try to grapple with this thought. Every single sin was contained in the violation of God's law when Adam ate the fruit. The seed of every sin was in that act. Just like seeds are in fruit and seeds proliferate and propagate and grow. Every single sin imaginable was in that act when Adam violated and ate the fruit. Now, as we know, when you see this little tiny seed, it takes time, and you have to have the opportunity in the environment. 
But given those things, this seed will eventually be a tree that produces apples. And in the same way, for Adam and Eve, instantly, when they sinned, they lost their spiritual nature. They became completely defenseless against evil. And unless God interposed at that point, which is what is happening in Genesis 3, unless God interposed at that point, life could not exist on this planet. And yet, God had a purpose. God is always prepared. He's not caught by surprise. And when transgression came in, instantly there was the promise of a savior. And God is going to bring in some restraints. First, he is going to restrain Satan and what he can do. He's not going to have complete control. He's going to have some access. He's going to be able to exercise his power to some degree. But it's only within the boundaries of God's permission. What story of the Bible tells us that most clearly? It's a story of the book of Job. The devil has to ask permission in order to harass Job. And in the stories of the New Testament, when uh, you read about the demoniac, they have to ask permission to enter into the swine. God's still ultimately in control. But Satan can do certain things. But he has to be limited or else life would not exist on this planet. God wanted and needed life to happen on this planet under these restraining conditions so that the seed could grow. The seed of evil and the seed of righteousness. Because what do we read there in Genesis chapter 3? It re we read in chapter 3 verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and that's capitalized. And if you look at the book of Galatians, in the New Testament, chapter 3 of Galatians, and verse 16, it's talking about the seed as well. It's recounting the promise given to Abraham that uses the term seed, but it's the same concept as Genesis 3. It says, to Abraham and his seed the promises were made. He does not say to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, capitalized, who is, what's the next word there? Christ. So we need to see seed in a positive as well as a negative sense. Seed, that is Christ, seed of righteousness. Seed of evil. Seed that looks harmless and small, but becomes big. In the Bible, uh, we find that dual usages of symbols uh, happen quite often. If I say, when you read in the Bible about a lion, is that good or bad? Well, you read in 1 Peter chapter 5 that the devil goes about as a roaring lion. That's lion used in a negative sense. But I'm seeing a banner over here and it talks about the lion of the tribe of Judah, taken from Revelation chapter 5. So lion can be positive or negative depending on the context. What about leaven? What is leaven? Leaven is yeast. Is that good or bad? Good. It's yes and no, isn't it? Leaven is good in the sense that, well, let me start the other side. Leaven was a symbol of sin in the Passover service. They were not allowed to have leaven in their house for a whole week. Why? Because they were to eat unleavened bread because it's the same, it's the same lesson. The same lesson. Leaven, you put a little leaven in the dough and it becomes big. It's this idea of expansion that uh, is being conveyed. And in that context, it's a symbol of sin. And in the Passover, the lamb and the bread, Jesus is the bread of life. In Jesus, was there any sin? No, absolutely not. So there could not be any leaven in the bread. So leaven is a symbol of sin in the Passover service. Then you go 50 days later down the road and you come to the Pentecost festival. And whereas leaven was prohibited in Passover, it's required in Pentecost. Why? Now it's used in a positive way. It's talking about the explosive growth that would take place on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached and thousands were converted. So we need to have our minds open to symbols being used this way, positively, or this way, negatively. Seed, negative. Seed in the fruit of transgression. What's that saying? Though it may look harmless, 
You have no idea. It's unimaginable what it can become. Now, Satan wants people to think that, that sin is no big deal. He even makes fun of the Bible story. Oh, they ate a piece of fruit. What's the big deal? A lot of people don't understand what the message of that was. In that transaction, every sin was contained, given time and opportunity. Every sin. You want to see what the Bible says about the heart that does not have a spiritual component? Let's look at a couple of texts. If you have your Bible, look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. <clears throat> Jeremiah 17, verse 9. What do we find here? The Bible's description of the human heart does not present a pretty picture. 17, 9, Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things and a little bit bad once in a while. Is that what it says? Desperately wicked. Who can know it? Take a look at um, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. That's a description of what life was like, what people were like before the flood. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's a very emphatic verse, isn't it? This is the heart without God. This is the heart that Adam and Eve had when they transgressed. And the evil that can come forth from that heart is unimaginable in the same way that you would hardly be able to guess what this seed can become. Sin is like that. That's why God didn't want sin to happen, but he made his creatures with freedom to choose. When sin happened, Jesus stepped in and said, I'll take, I'll take the punishment myself. But something else has to happen. In order for life to exist on this planet, something has to happen. Go back to Genesis 3.15. Let's take a cl closer look at the phrases there. Genesis 3.15 is a prophecy and a promise. A prophecy. It says, I will put enmity. What does enmity mean? Enmity means anger, wrath, fury. I will put enmity between, he's talking to the snake, he's talking to the serpent, Lucifer. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. What is this a prophecy of? It's talking about the hatred that Satan would exercise toward Jesus when he came to this earth. I will put enmity between you and the seed. Now, why does it say that God would do that? What we have to understand is that in the Bible, because God is sovereign over everything, nothing happens without God's permission. So that sometimes God is said to do what he allows. In the Bible, it says, I, the Lord, create evil. Well, how do we understand that? That's a strange text. Well, we have to understand it in the context that he allows it to happen in that he gives creatures freedom to choose. He doesn't want it. He winces when it happens, but it would not happen if he did not give his permission. So sometimes God is said to do what he allows, and he allowed Satan access to do anything against Jesus when he was on this earth. And from the very moment of his birth, what do we find in Revelation chapter 12? We find that the dragon was standing ready before the woman who was ready to give birth. And what did that translate to in real life? It was Herod sending his armies to Bethlehem to kill the babies because the wise men told him that's, that he found out that that was where, he, where he was born. Hatred exhibited against Satan all through Christ's life. And as Brother June was mentioning in the Sabbath school class, even in his growing up years, Satan saw to it that hatred was... Uh, manifested against Christ. And then, of course, the days of his ministry from start to finish, from the time of the temptations all the way up to Calvary, Satan brought forth his fury and his wrath. There was enmity, not only against Christ, but against his followers. And you and I experience that to some degree today. But we experience it in a limited way. A limited way. God inserted limitations in two ways. First, he said, Satan, I know you think you won the planet. I, think you think that, I know you think you have the keys, but your power is going to be limited. And secondly, with respect to man's nature, 
even though he lost his spiritual nature, it died. The Lord said, I'm going to make provision. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to convict of sin. And conscience, as we call it, will be a moral compass to keep people on the path. Now, they can reject it. They can forfeit it. They can push it away. But at least it's there. And the Bible says that Jesus is the light that lights every man and woman coming into the world. Every person was given some aspect. In, Rev in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, to every person there has been given the measure of faith. Now, what we do with that is up to us. Whether we feed it, nourish it, allow it to grow, or whether we neglect it, that's up to us. But the Lord said, I'm going to do these two things. I'm going to limit what Satan can do. Do you know that before they fell, Satan was confined to the tree. He was chained to that tree, so to speak. He could not harass Adam and Eve throughout the garden. But once transgression came in, then what? That chain was broken. And he's been all over the planet since then. But his powers are still limited. Otherwise, life couldn't exist. God wanted this planet to be the laboratory to show what the seeds become. When Lucifer tempted the angels in heaven, and even when he tempted Eve, it was as if he had in his hand seeds. And he was promoting a sale. Take these seeds. You know, one time, my, pa my parents were given a seed. It was a rather large seed, about an inch and a half long, kind of oblong, oblong in shape. We had no idea what it was. How do you find out what it is? Stick it in the ground. We watered it. It became a tree. It produced fruit called sapoti. Anybody know about sapoti fruit? It's very rich, very, very sweet. We don't see too much of it on earth. But that's how you find out what the seeds become. You give it time and opportunity. The Lord wanted this earth to be the garden in which the seeds would grow, both of evil and of righteousness. The seed representing sin and the seed representing Christ and those who follow him. Now, God has had his restraints on Satan and evil passion of man's hearts through conscience. Otherwise, life wouldn't exist. But still, he wants the universe to know once and for all really what these seeds become. We have not seen that yet. Now, that may shock you. You see on the news every week heinous crimes, terrible tragedies, evil all around, wickedness. We have not yet seen the full expression of evil. Not yet. Because God's restraints have been in place. But the Bible says that one day, it says that there are angels now holding back the winds. But one day, those winds, and that's the wind of wickedness, whether it's what Satan does or what evil human passion does, those winds will be released. When is that going to take place? That will take place after everyone has made up their mind once and all for, for God, and we, we have the close of probation. We're not there yet. Sister White says that we cannot imagine what life will be like after that, because that's when sin will reach its fullest expression. We're not there yet. As wicked as this world is, as terrible as the crimes are that are, that are committed, we haven't seen the full demonstration of what evil was. God is known. Lucifer came with the seeds in his hands, said, take these. The Lord tried to tell him, but it had to be lived out. Now, this doesn't mean that their transgression was good. Don't take that from it. But God is using that as a means so that the universe can see once and for all. Now, when that happens, there cannot be a long period of time between that and when Jesus Christ comes in the sky. There would be nobody left. Now, the righteous will be protected during that time. Psalm 91. What did Jesus say to the people of Jerusalem? How often I wanted to protect you like a mother hen, but you would not be willing. But for those people who have accepted Christ and, and experienced the shelter and the protection that he gives, they'll be safe during that storm. But for all others, no. No. So the message I want to share with you today in a seed thought is that Sin is evil. There's nothing good in it. Satan makes jokes about it. There's a city up the road here not too far. What are they, what's the nickname of that city? Sin City. 
That's said in jest, isn't it? As if it's nothing. Not true. Sin is evil. There's no, nothing good in sin. And as Christians, as those who trust God and believe him, we ought to be learning that lesson. There is nothing good in sin. Calvin Coolidge was known as a man of few words. And one, one week he went to church. His wife wasn't able to make it. When he came home, she said, what was the sermon about? And Calvin Coolidge said he spoke about sin. And she said, what did he say about it? He was against it. There's food for thought in that response. There's nothing good in sin. It may seem harmless and small, but it grows big beyond our imagination. But the good news is that Christ, the seed, he is there as our Savior. And even though the power of sin is strong, Christ is stronger. Do you know that parable in Luke chapter 11? We'll close with this. Our time is going by. Luke chapter 11. Let's turn to that passage. And in verse 21, Luke, 20, Luke 11, 21. It's a long time that I read this and didn't really understand what it was talking about. Luke eleven twenty one. 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. That's describing a person who does not have Christ in their life. The devil is the strong man. Is the devil stronger than us? Yes, he is. He's wiser, has much more experience. He's the strong man. And when, when he's in charge and God is not there, there's a, there's a sense of peace because there's not conflict. Now verse 22. But... When a stronger than he comes upon him. Who's that? That's Jesus. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is stronger than the devil. Grace is stronger than sin. Love is stronger than hatred. When the stronger than he comes and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. So there is hope for us, even though we live in a world. Some people wonder or maybe even complain, why was I born on planet Earth? Why couldn't I have been an angel born, uh, come, come to life in heaven? But you know what? Having been born here and having the chance to live for God's honor and accept Christ into our life and live for him, no one is going to complain about that in heaven. I can tell you that. If you are faithful to the Lord, the Lord is going to overwhelm you with honors in heaven for standing faithfully for him. Yes, it's true. We were born with defective characters. That's true. But the seed of righteousness we can accept into our lives. And that can blossom into a fruit, the fruits of the Spirit, that will give God glory. My appeal to you today, receive Christ every day and ask for the power, the seed of righteousness in your life. Because we're getting close to the end. And the harvest time is coming. Two harvests the Bible talks about. Revelation 14. Two harvests. Harvest of grapes. That's the harvest of wickedness. That's when the restraints are moved and it will be seen what sin is like. And the harvest of the grain. The harvest of those who have committed their life to Jesus and have allowed the fruits of the Spirit to be lived out in them. Do you want to be part of that harvest? I surely do. Let's sing our closing hymn as we conclude our worship service. Our closing song will be Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 469. Please stand.
Father in heaven, it has been good to be in your house today. We marvel at the magnificence of the plan of salvation, that immediately you stepped in with a plan to save us. Lord, we know that sin is strong, but we know also that Jesus is stronger. Lord, we pray that each day we will commit our lives to him so that he can live his life out within us and the fruits of righteousness will be exhibited in our lives. To this end we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we want to thank the uh, pastor for coming and the church for coming up. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure to, to hear them singing and also to hear the pastor's sermon. He shed some light on this. Now, I need to apologize to you folks because I had a confused, I was confused on uh, what I was supposed to do. And uh, I uh, didn't, didn't run things accordingly. Okay. Can you hear me now? No. Not all right. Okay, now there, there you go. I just want to apologize because I have, I didn't do the things right. I misunderstood, and I thought, um, basically, I thought they were, had their own program. But we want to, I want to thank, thank them for coming up. They had some beautiful music, and thank the pastor for coming up. And um, now we'll go over and have dinner, and two, three. Okay, lift up the trumpet. We have to sing lift up the trumpet. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll get some singer up here that will uh, sing for me. Lift up the trumpet. Lift up the trumpet. 